Hi, my name is Raisa. I'm a biomedical scientist at SRS Hair Clinic and I'm the head of our laboratory and production. So just a little bit of background about our company, SRS Hair Clinic. We have over three decades of experience of treating various different types of hair loss from generalized thinning to female and male pattern baldness, alopecia areata, hair pulling and so on in men, women and children. So we originate from Germany where we had about seven private clinics spread throughout Europe and we also established in Australia and in New Zealand. So over the years we have seen many a case of alopecia areata and also different types of alopecia and we have experience in helping to treat those. In anticipation of this alopecia areata conference that Nicola and other organisers have put together, I have been asked to answer a few questions. So I hope they're helpful for you and if you do have any other questions um, or would like to get in contact, our details will be at the end of this video. So alopecia is defined as an autoimmune condition, so that's um, basically when the immune system attacks its own, its own tissues, and in this case that is going to be the hair follicles. And what we found over the last three decades is it quite frequently occurs in people that have a family history of either alopecia itself or other autoimmune conditions. So that can be ranging from rheumatoid arthritis, uh, vitiligo, lupus, diabetes as well. So it, it just appears that they, their immune system might be more sensitive. Claire has asked for some more information about what methods we use when we see alopecia clients at our hair clinic. Um, the first step, and this is something that we do for all of our clients, is we would like to see you for what's called a microscopic hair analysis consultation. So what that involves is we have two specialised microscopes. With the first one, we'll take a hair sample. We'll look at the hair root um, under the microscope, see if there's any deformations there. What does the hair shaft look like? Um, is there an oily sheath around the base of it? Those sorts of things. And then with the second microscope, we'll be narrowing in on various sections of the scalp. So looking at um, if there's any redness there or itchiness or dandruff. Um, and especially with alopecia, we do also look at the, uh, the pores, the hair density. So um, comparing areas where the patches are versus um, areas of no patches. So we can also see the number of hairs that are coming out of the pores. Um, and speaking of the pores, are they open? Um, are they open and empty? Are they, are they closed completely? Are they cl um, completely sealed over as well? Because that does inform us of how advanced the particular case is and also um, how, we can, how, how we can help. Because quite often, obviously, if the pores are completely closed over and smoothed over, then it does become a little bit tricky. Um, but if the pores are, for example, empty, but uh, we can still see them, they're basically what we call dormant, then um, that, is, uh, that is still possible to help there. Um, hair loss is a complex condition. Many people like to think of it in terms of one, one cause, one effect. Um, that is unfortunately not often the case. So what does happen is we can have multiple different factors that come together to lead to the final outcome. So in practical terms, what that means is that we might ask you about um, some, some questions about your family history, for example, lifestyle, diet, nutrition, ongoing stress, um, trauma. So those things may have a bearing on the, ult the ultimate outcome. Okay, so one example of this in Germany, we had a school, we had multiple young school aged children um, that came to our clinic presenting with alopecia areata patches. So um, what we found is that when more and more of these kids came from the same school, um, obviously you start asking questions. So when the immediate questions of what, um, what's happening at home, are there any sort of stresses at home, what's the family life like, once those are ruled out, um, and we found that they all came from the same area, then we started asking questions about the school itself. So what's happening there, is, is, is there a certain um, program, what, you know, is the, what, what's the behaviour of the school like? Um, where's the land that the school is built on? And that was actually a crucial point because we found out that um, the land that the school had been built on was an old landfill site. Um, and presumably, even though it had been given all the proper resource consents from councils and so on, um, presumably that something was still happening there. So there was some sort of chemical runoff or chemical residue um, in the soil itself, fumes, um, whatever it was, um, but we did uh, identify that once, once parents started pulling their kids out of that school um, and with the aid of treatment as well, that their hair loss did, did resolve. Another often 
underestimated key factor in alopecia areata is stress. So obviously everyone in the population suffers from stress, but the difference being that with people with alopecia areata, their immune system tends to react a lot differently. So it can become more sensitive to different stresses. So um, obviously in this case, finding ways of managing that stress is really, really important. So could be, uh, could be work stress, could be family stress, um, but as much as possible if you can, you know, I know that's, that's hard to say, but um, if you can try to minimize that as much as possible, that is something that we do advise our clients. Uh, we did have another example recently where a client of ours was experiencing a lot of work stress, um, and that was stemming from his physical environment itself. So being presumably around colleagues and in the actual physical workplace location. So what happened was during lockdown, um, which uh, was both opportune, I suppose, and uh, w even with all the negative effects, um, he, his hair loss was actually, um, his hair was performing much better um, because he was getting the appropriate sleep. Obviously his stress level was going down, so the work stress itself um, was still there, but then um, the other stresses from colleagues, et cetera, was, uh, that was, that was minimized. Okay, so genetics and alopecia, obviously that's something that we can't control. What we have found is that people with alopecia may be sensitive, more sensitive across the board to various other autoimmune conditions. So that is um, still something to be aware of and it does um, inform our recommendation for treatment as well. So Nicola asked the question about what common treatments are available for alopecia areata. First of all, as, as alopecia is an autoimmune disease, what um, it can be quite unpredictable. So what people tend to find in the in early initial stages particularly is that um, quite often it can appear to self-resolve, um, but then it may reoccur again. And that usually tends to happen within a relatively short space of time, about one year or just over a year. Um, and that can happen in multiple cycles. Um, currently there is no known cure for alopecia, but there are some very common treatments that are sort of um, used and recommended across the board. So I'll just uh, summarize some of those. Um, you may have already been familiar with some of them. Number one is corticosteroids. So there's three different, three different types, um, main types. So you can either have creams, you can have steroid injections, or you can have um, oral tablets. Talking about the steroid injections, what's involved in that um, is basically, that's one of the most common solutions. So you will Focusing on the bold patches, you will get multiple intralesional or intradermal injections in those sites. So obviously that will depend on how big the site is. So the corticosteroid is going to be injected just beneath the skin. And the function of that, um, corticosteroids will help to suppress the immune system. So presumably if, um, because alopecia is considered an autoimmune condition, um, that is thought to interrupt that process. If you're suppressing the immune response, um, there is nothing there to attack the hair follicles. Um, and generally what happens there is that um, it is a long-term treatment, so you will need to repeat that usually every six to 12 weeks. Um, and of course there are some, there are some minor side effects, um, physical side effects. So obviously some people experience some sort of minor local bleeding or bruising, headaches, those tend to be a bit more rare. Um, what can happen with long-term use of those steroid injections, however, is that there can be small indentations in the skin. So usually those tend to go away, but they can, um, they can become more per permanent if, uh, with long-term use. Um, corticosteroid creams, on the other hand, so those are usually used um, as a first step, very similar um, in terms of the, the sort of theory behind that. They also help to suppress the immune system, but it's just a topically applied cream, just as any other which is applied on those patches. Um, and usually used in children, so it's um, obviously you don't want to, um, especially if they have a fear of needles, then that's just a more um, friendly option to go with at the very beginning. And thirdly, we have the oral tablets. So those are generally used in more severe and advanced cases of alopecia or um, also if someone is not responding to the injection treatment. Yeah. The only difference being there is that with the injections and the cream, obviously that's a more localized effect, which is just, um, in the area where it's applied essentially, whereas uh, if you're taking a tablet that's going to have system-wide effects, so the whole body is going to be involved in that. Um, and obviously the side effects there are a little bit, the, the list is a bit longer there. Um, especially in uh, women, what we, what we see is that uh, they will have some sort of hormonal effects as well, so some might have irregular periods, and of course you, if you're taking a steroid there are going to be, it's, it's a hormone, so you're going to be having some wider effects there.
Another category of alopecia treatment is contact immunotherapy and you have a competing immune response, um, so you have a particular chemical um, that is applied to the bold patches. What you're going to find happens in that period of time is it's not going to be very pleasant. Um, you're going to have a rash, redness, swelling, all of those nasty things that you usually don't want. If the immune system is involved in attacking the hair follicles, you're basically giving them something else to, to get worked up about instead. Um, and if you have that competing immune response, um, hopefully the hair follicles are not going to be attacked um, and you've just got the localised rash, etc. That's, um, that's going to be happening instead. The disadvantages of that, obviously, again, variable results. Um, obviously, it is not a very pleasant experience and that is something that is going to have to be repeated weekly. So that can happen um, until, you know, usually the period of trial and error is about six months. So if you're doing it weekly, you're not seeing much of a response there, then that's when they will start to discontinue that. It does require long-term maintenance and regular use. So if you do decide to discontinue it, um, what some people find is that they can go back to square one. So basically, uh, when you're doing that and starting that, you do want to be doing that regularly. Drug-based options, so very similar um, to the oral tablets, actually. It's going to be the same, same in theory, except that they are different immunosuppressants, so various classes of immunosuppressants. Um, that is something you will need to speak with your GP or perhaps dermatologist about, um, depending on who is going to be recommending that. Um, there can be a whole host of side effects, as with any drug-based option and treatment. Uh, so, for example, some like methotrexane, they are cancer treatments. So, as you can imagine, there is a whole host of unpleasant side effects that you might have to be willing to deal with. And, you know, your GP is going to be very helpful in deciding whether the, best, the benefits outweigh the risks there. Um, there are also the general drug-based hair loss treatment options out there, such as minoxidil and finasteride. So, those obviously come with their own host of side effects. So um, they are often given in combination as well with corticosteroid drug treatment options or other immunosuppressants. Um, so th those tend to be combination therapies as well. Um, and again, with, uh, with minoxidil or finasterides, those are long-term treatments. So you're going to need to be taking, you're going to need to be committed to those because if you do decide to discontinue them, um, again, you can go back to square one because all of the hair that was maintained during that period can fall out again. Moving on to Paul's question about what clinical basis we follow for our treatments. In terms of our treatment, what we offer is a 100% natural topical formula and that uh, works as a three-in-one. So it helps to prevent further hair loss, uh, strengthen the existing hair and thirdly and most importantly is it helps to encourage the body to regrow its own hair again. So the way it works is it helps to clean, clear and unblock the hair follicles. It supports the microcirculation of the scalp which helps to provide optimum nourishment to the hair follicles and thereby promote healthy hair growth. It is, as I mentioned, 100% natural, it doesn't have any side effects and it is non-invasive. So the way it's designed to be used is it is applied twice daily. So you just rub it into the scalp, not on the hair, but into the skin. You can do that yourself. So there's no need to come into the clinic, um, you know, to see us and to get treatment applied all the time. We also offer three monthly follow-up appointments where we track your progress. We can uh, provide support throughout the treatment and we can actually show you um, how you're tracking, how your progress is going with reference to microscope photos and also um, global photos that we take throughout the course of the treatment. So having discussed a lot of the standard treatments that are available for alopecia and that tend to get recommended by GPs and dermatologists, um, I can just say that we do tend to see uh, clients that have already been through all of those treatments um, for whom they haven't necessarily received the results that they may have hoped for. Um, so that's basically our basis for starting, that's where we tend to come in. So because our company orig originates from Germany, um, that, that is, Germany is basically the strictest, or the European Union is known as the strictest um, in terms of safety standards for cosmetics. Um, we're quite familiar with that and it does align well with our own philosophy of always um, giving the highest quality of treatment to our clients. So uh, we have had our products tested according to those strict criteria from the European Cosmetics Directive. Um, and as one of those examples, so there were various safety tests. Um, one of the dermatological tests, as an example, was performed on a range of subjects, volunteer subjects, with 
normal skin, sensitive skin, eczema prone skin. And so that, um, having done that test, they all came back completely harmless. So there were zero reactions found in anyone. Um, a healthy hair tonic, as another example, was the subject of a scientific study in Germany uh, in the 90s, performed on just over 190 different test subjects, and we found that there was an over 80% rate of success. Um, based on both subjective patient ratings of their hair quality and hair fall and hair health, as well as more qualitative um, markers of hair fall and hair health. And you can read more about that on our website as well. So all of that information is, is on there. And our manufacturing laboratory just uh, also operates according to GMP. So that's good manufacturing practice. And that is something that's used worldwide as a standard of quality manufacturing. Claire also asked about our success stories. We do have a number of clients with alopecia areata. Some of them have very kindly allowed us to show their photographs to other clients and um, basically the public who are interested in, in those treatments. We're happy to show just a few before and after photos on screen for you. Um, we do have uh, photographs available on our website, so you're most welcome to look there. Um, if you are interested in uh, um, microscopic hair analysis consultation, we do also tend to cover that and show you. And just on that note, <clears throat> typically we can show you something that's more perhaps aligned with the stage of hair loss that you are at or the extent of the alopecia areata, so that is just another option there as well. But just a final note that regardless of what treatment you choose, the key factor is that you need to be patient because hair loss in general is a complex condition, it's not easy and it's not going to be solved overnight. Alopecia areata on top of that is obviously a lot more complicated and unpredictable on top of that as well. So just very important to be patient and to be understanding of that. And I would just like to thank Nicola and all the other organizers of this event. They've put a lot of time and effort into organizing this for you just um, so that there is a, a place where, where people who are suffering from alopecia areata and alopecia totalis um, universalis can have a space where they can talk about that with each other and find out some more information. So I hope that you've learned something and that this has been helpful for you. Thank you.